This new series that we are going through is called A Framework for the Mind. Okay, we're going through the book of Proverbs. We're calling it A Framework for the Mind. For a couple of the overnighters, I shared this with you guys, all of us have a framework in our heads. And a part of that framework, there's two different kinds of wisdom that are going on. One part of the framework in our mind comes from the wisdom of this world. We learn it from our parents. We learn it from our teachers. We learn it from books that we read. We learn it from our friends. Uh, we learn it from our celebrities. Um, but there's also another part of wisdom in us that's supposed to be greater, but for many of us it's probably smaller. It's godly wisdom. Not worldly wisdom, but godly wisdom. And godly wisdom comes from God's word, um, and that's supposed to shape how we live. Um, and this is what I'm going to talk about today is uh, how this particular book, the book of Proverbs, how it teaches us to build the framework for our mind. Because what happens is whatever the framework is in your mind, most likely that framework is shaping your attitude and who you are becoming. It shapes how you make your decisions and it shapes uh, how you analyze a situation and what steps you move taking forward. Uh, that's what the framework impacts. And so if that impact isn't from God's word, then most likely you have been growing and building your life in a very ungodly way. Maybe not necessarily a bad way, but ungodly nonetheless, okay? And so we're going to be talking about this today. Um, does anyone know what a proverb is? What is a proverb? Uh, Pastor Timothy Keller, um, again, one of my favorite Christian authors in the 21st century, this is what he writes. Proverb, a proverb is a poetic, terse, which means concise, vivid, thought-provoking saying that conveys a world of truth in a few words. Okay? A proverb is a poetic, terse, vivid, thought-provoking saying that conveys a world of truth in a few words. Now, one of the things that Pastor Timothy Keller says as he uh, explains what Proverbs is, is he says that uh, pro a proverb cannot, be, um, cannot stand alone. A proverb, a wise saying, has to be compared to many wise sayings in order to understand the full uh, concept of what it's trying to get at regarding the truth that it's pointing out. Um, and so you have to compare these things together. And so there are a bunch of Proverbs in the book of Proverbs, in God's word. Proverbs are also parables or can be parables. That's the way Jesus taught. Um, but there's also a lot of Proverbs that come from the world, like the Dalai Lama, uh, Siddhartha, if you guys have ever read that, um, where, where, you know, the birth of Buddhism. Um, there's a lot of wisdom around the world, but you and I, we have to learn to distinguish what is the wisdom that comes from God and what is the wisdom that doesn't come from God? What is one that honors God and what is, what's the wisdom that doesn't honor God? We have to be able to distinguish and discern that well. And for you, your guys' age, being youth, even going up into university, discernment is one of the things that this book of Proverbs is meant for. And we'll cover that in a little bit, okay? So did you guys write that down? Proverbs? Uh, the word in parentheses is the word Proverbs in Hebrew. It's mashal. Say that with me. Mashal. Mashal, okay? That's a proverb. It is a poetic, terse, vivid, thought-provoking saying that conveys a world of truth in a few words. Now, I'm going to give you some North American Proverbs. These are uh, 19th century, maybe, yeah, 19th century on, uh, or no, 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 sorry, 20th century on, uh, just North American Proverbs that we've come to use today in the, in, in the modern day as well, all right? These are just some of the ones that you may know, some you may not know, okay? The first one is this. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, okay? Uh, this proverbial saying, uh, the meaning of it is that when the people you love are not with you, your love for them grows more because you miss them or you learn your appreciation for them. My wife, she just got back from a children's pastor's conference this past week, and from Monday to Saturday, I was alone. And my wife, before leaving, she was like, Namphyeon, don't party too hard, right? Um, and so I was like, oh, I'm not going to do that. But then and I was like, oh, yeah, dude, you know. <laughs> but I was actually very lonely. 
I actually, the, the entire week this past week, I stayed more at church rather than going home because I knew if I went home, no one was going to be there. My wife wasn't there. And it felt weird because we've been living together now, right? And so after, after working at church, I, I would go home and I would sit down on the couch and it would just feel so empty because I'm used to hearing cat videos, you know, coming from my wife or like mukbang videos, you know, that she's watching and stuff. Um, but there was none of that. And so I sat there and I was like, oh, man, like, I think I miss my wife. And so absence made my heart grow fonder for my wife out of my appreciation of the delicious food that she makes me because I just had lamyun and stuff. Um, yeah, okay, so this is a proverbial saying in North America. Um, the next one, a bad workman always blames his tools. A bad workman always blames his tools. The meaning of this is a person with a bad attitude tends to blame their poor performance on other people or other things instead of realizing that the problem is them. If I didn't get straight A's or like if I got a D or an F on my report card and my mom would be like, Hanjina, why'd you get a D? Or why are you failing this class? And my typical response to my mom was, Amma, I was born left-handed. When's on jabby? But then you forced me to write with my right hand. Odin son jabby. My brain's confused. <laughs> That's why I'm getting a D, right? I blame it on the tool. I blame it on my mom. I blame it on the fact that she made a lefty become a righty. But the truth of it is the problem's actually me because I didn't, I didn't kumbuhe enough, right? A bad workman always blames his tools. Uh, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. The meaning of this proverb is that no matter how big the task, every endeavor starts with a small step. Anything you pursue begins with a small step. Michael Jordan didn't become great because he was just epically great at basketball. Michael Jordan practiced, practiced, practice started with one shot 10 shots 100 shots a thousand shots 10,000 shots 10 thousands of shots in order to get to where he got to in the NBA every big endeavor starts with a small step for those of you in like grade 11 and 12 you know 5,000 word essay oh what is this I can't do that what it work well how am I going to write 5,000 you begin by just writing 100 words a day just 100 words what is that? That's not even a full page, is it? I think a full page is 150 words? 500 words? One page? Start with 100 words, okay? You don't have to try to fill up the whole page, all right? 100 words a day. Every endeavor begins with a small step. You, you can't overcome anything if you don't make that first small step. So that's a pretty good one. Um, the fourth one is always put your best foot forward, okay? Always put your best foot forward. You guys should know this one. This one is whatever you do, just give it your very best. Whatever you do, give it your best effort. Everything that you pursue, give it your best effort. Grade 12s, your college apps, give it your best effort, okay? Everything that you do, give it your best effort. Your projects in school, give it your best efforts. Like I was talking to one of your, 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 your peers the other, the other time, and, and they were like, dude, I hate P.E., like, PE is just not my thing. It's just not my thing. Even if it's not your thing, you have to give it your best. You have to give it your best. Everything, always put your best foot forward in everything that you do. This last one, clothes do not make the man or woman. Clothes do not make the man or woman, meaning this. You never judge a person's character by their outward appearance. Because a person's true character isn't what you see on the outside. A person's true character is actually what's on the inside. It's in their heart. So never judge a person by their outward appearance. And actually, this proverb is very biblical. It actually comes from the Bible. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 6 and 7, God tells Samuel the kind of king that he's looking for after King Saul. And so when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab, who is the eldest son of Jesse, all right, uh, David's father, and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. 
The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Amen? Okay, it's not how you look on the outside, Jemute. When it comes to your walk with Christ, and especially for those of you who are in student discipleship, I am not looking for a clean outward appearance. I am looking for an honest heart because God looks for an honest heart. The way that I view you when I look at you is I look at your heart. I try to see where is your heart, what is the motive of your heart, because that's where your true character lies. That's, what's, that, that's the thing that, that God's interested in. It's in our heart. And so these are just a few examples of some modern-day Proverbs in North America. Um, in the Bible, however, in the Bible, a proverb is meant to help the reader or listener to choose the best course of action whenever a life-shaping or life-altering decision needs to be made. That's why the book of Proverbs exists. It's meant to help us to take the best course of action or to make the best decision in every life-shaping decision or life-altering decision. That is the main purpose of the book of Proverbs. Okay? Again, kind of like the last one that we read, clothes do not make the man or woman. It's not about how you look on the outside, but it's about what your heart looks like on the inside. What is your intent? What is your intent? The other week, a couple of our peers here in Jemute, uh, two friends, they got into an argument. And we talked, or I talked with one of them, and I was getting at the heart of the issue. And they realized that both of their hearts weren't kind of in the right place. And as, as soon as they acknowledged that, God reconciled their relationship rather than allowing them to be separated. This is godly wisdom. This is what it means to live with God's wisdom in our lives. Okay, so as you read through the book of Proverbs, you'll gain something. And we call this insight, okay, insight. I'm going to give you the definition of insight, okay. Insight is the capacity to gain a deeper understanding of someone or something. It's the capacity to gain a deeper understanding of someone or something something just like i had shared the two the two the, the the two brothers who got into that argument they allowed the holy spirit to show them something deeper about the situation than just what was on the surface and because they allowed the holy spirit to give them that insight to have a deeper understanding to the whole situation they were able to make the godly decision to think about the greater community rather than about what was going on in their hearts. Okay? This is insight. Now, as you grow with insight, as you gain a deeper understanding about people and, and life situations, you're able to make a good and healthy judgment when it comes to your decision-making. And the healthiness, Gem Youth, the healthiness of your decision-making, that's what wisdom is. Okay? Wisdom is the quality of your actions and decisions. I'm giving you guys a lot of definitions here because I want you guys to understand whenever you read the book of Proverbs, you need to understand the terms that are being written and what they are meant for, okay? Wisdom is the quality of our actions and decisions. Grade sevens, particularly boys, I love you. I love you guys. Last Sunday, I apologize. I know I got a little serious, all right? My heart was kind of, on fire, okay? And, 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 I, and I, I know that wasn't, I, I love you guys. If I didn't care about you, I wouldn't say anything. But the example last Sunday is their wisdom is, it was very poor. Because the quality, the quality of their decision to talk when someone else is talking, that's very, that's very poor wisdom. That, that's not good wisdom. The quality of it is very bad. Um, you guys, Probably do this with your parents. When they're trying to talk, you interrupt them. Hajima, just hear them out. Listen. All right, the quality of your actions and your decisions, that's what shows what kind of wisdom you have going on in your mind and in your heart. How you make your choices, how you make your decisions, that's what wisdom is. It's the quality. Okay? 
And throughout the book of Proverbs, you'll find that wisdom actually has to do not just with the quality of our Christian life or when we're at church or when we're gathered here because we tend to do this, right? When we're at church, we try to look like a good Christian, act like a good Christian, do all those things. And once we leave here and Pastor Josh isn't looking at me anymore or my church friends aren't around me anymore, then you end up doing things that you know wouldn't be right. We act like that, but godly wisdom actually has to do with the quality of our daily life. It has to do with everything about our lives. Godly wisdom has to do with the way that you honor your parents. It has to do with the way that you treat your friends. It has to do with the way you care for your younger and your older siblings. Godly wisdom has to do with the way that you use your money. Godly wisdom has to do with uh, how you learn. Some of you don't like to learn. That's a problem. The Bible calls you simple-minded and foolish. Godly wisdom has to do with the quality of our response to everyday life. Okay? Um, this is what Solomon writes in today's passage in verses 1 to 6. We're just going to go through the whole thing. I have some words highlighted, okay, as to what this book is supposed to teach us. Um, These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. Solomon is saying, even for those of you who are filled with godly wisdom, there's still so much more for you to learn. There's still so much more for God to teach us. Let these help you to become even wiser, okay? Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning in these proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. This last, these last two verses, verses 5 and 6, this is very similar to the command that God gives to Joshua. One, he says, meditate on my word day and night. Do not falter to the left or to the right, but meditate on my word. Sit with it. Explore it. Dig deep in it. Um, the illustration that Pastor Timothy Keller gives about the book of Proverbs, he said when you're reading the book of Proverbs um, or when you're reading uh, one of Jesus' parables, it's kind of like taktakan candy, all right? You put it in your mouth, and if you bite down on it, you chip a tooth. All right, it's not going to benefit you. Uh, you have to put it in your mouth and you just let it sit and let it do its thing. And you allow it to just melt over time. You give it time for the hard candy to just go and you realize the flavors, you realize the intensity, you realize everything, the way it's even affecting your taste buds. That's how we're supposed to sit with God's word, Jamie. Your QT and your devotional isn't, oh, oh, okay, I read a verse, I'm good, awesome. I wrote even a couple of things. Sweet, I'm done. That's not meditating on God's word. Meditating on God's word is with God's word. You let it sit. Even though you feel like it's ready, you give it a little bit more time. And you say, God, what are you trying to say to me? What are you showing me in your word? Okay? Everything that King Solomon is saying here is that wisdom shapes the quality of our response to life. All of these things, the discipline, the understanding, the insight, growing in wisdom, learning to do what is right, just, and fair, learning how to discern, and then also being guided through that discernment, all of these are meant to help us to make the best decision and to take the best course of action in every life-shaping, life-altering event that comes our way. This is the purpose of the book of Proverbs. Okay? Now, we don't get all of our wisdom from the Bible. That's for sure. Some of us gain wisdom from our friends. We gain wisdom from uh, popular culture, pop culture. We, we gain wisdom from celebrities that we like to follow. We gain wisdom from our parents who teach us maybe in the way that they were taught, but it's not always a godly way. It might be good, but it's not godly. Um, and, and so these are the, the types of things that we all take in. And you guys, being the screen age 
generation, you guys take in a lot of stuff. You guys absorb a lot of different things. You guys learn even wisdom through vines. You guys learn wisdom through those short videos. Like, you don't think it. You just look at it and you're like, ha, 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 ha. You know, and you go to the next one. Ha, 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 ha. You know, you like it or you don't like it. But it's more than that. It's actually shaping you. It's actually shaping you and your attitude and your response to life. Uh, one of the things that I don't like about these, like, ADD things that are coming up through app, app, apps and stuff is that you guys really are losing the, 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 the preciousness of just sitting with something. Even if you don't fully understand it, but just, just to sit with it, like we're losing that. You're always trying to absorb and take in something in a shorter amount of time or in the shortest amount of time. That is not healthy, Jemute. That's not biblical wisdom. That's not godly wisdom. That's the way the world likes to gain knowledge, and that's the way the world likes to gain wisdom. But when it comes to God's word in our lives, it takes time. It takes time, which is why a day to God can feel like a thousand years to man. It takes time. I know that this isn't a famous proverb anymore, but this was a, this was a proverbial saying. I, every time I heard it, I hated it. it the, the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, one of the modern proverbs of, of your generation. YOLO, I hate it. You know why? Because it makes you forget that there's actually another life that's coming. You forget that there's two lives and two deaths that the Bible teaches us about. There's a life now. And there's a life that comes after. There's the death now, physically, and there's also an eternal death after. It causes you to forget that. So when you live with the YOLO mentality, most likely you are not preparing yourself for the life that's coming. You're just enjoying the life that's now, but that's a very foolish way to live. Because the wise person, a person who is filled with God's wisdom, knows that this life is not the only life that there is. There is another life that is coming. That's godly wisdom. Okay, YOLO, no. You throw that out the window. No. Okay. Another modern proverb, and I've said this before in, in, in a few of my sermons, um, and you probably hear it. A lot of my African-American friends like to say this. Um, you do you. Do you, Josh. Whatever you want to do, because like, have you guys ever, I don't, when you go and eat with your friends, are you the type of person to like wait until they make a decision before you make a decision? Or like whatever they say they're going to get, then that kind of impacts the way that, you know, what you're going to get. I, I do that sometimes. Um, and I remember my friend Anton, uh, he would always be like, whenever we went to like Wendy's or Carl's Jr. or something, I'd always be like, dude, Anton, what are you going to get? I'm like, do, do you, man? Do, why are you asking me? I don't know what you want. I'm not Korean. You know, <laughs> you know I'm black, man. What, what do you, I don't know. You do you, Josh. Just, just get what you want. Um, this proverb, the deeper meaning of this proverb, this modern proverb, is the decisions you make for yourself are the best ones because this life is all about you. That's what you do you means. Every decision you make is the best one for you because you're living your life. You do you. It's all about you. But again, that is a very foolish way of living according to the Bible. The Bible teaches us that this life is not about us, which is why we're going through the Purpose Driven Life series. This life is not about you did not create you. Your parents didn't even create you. God created you. And when you die, you and I, we do not have the capability of building ourselves a heaven that we can enjoy. We are either going to go to the place that Jesus is preparing for us in our Heavenly Father's kingdom, or you're going to H-E double hockey sticks. That's godly wisdom. I can't, I can't do me. I can't do what I think is best for me because my life is not about me. I came from God, and either I will go back to God, or I will go apart from God. That's it. That is the dash of our life. Our birth year and our death year, once those dates are set, that's all you have is we came from God and we were made to go back to him or to go apart from him. That's it. So no, I cannot do me. 
And everything that I do has to be about God for God because that's where I'm going back to. And that's, that's where I want to go back to. I want to go back to God. I want to be in his presence, like that presence without the brokenness, without the pain, without the tears. I want to be with God. So, no, I cannot agree with the modern proverb, you do you, because it's not biblical. It's not based on God's word. It sounds nice, but it's not godly. Everything that we're going to be talking about in this series is the relationship between godly wisdom and foolishness, true wisdom and foolishness. Uh, Jesus gives a parable about this through the analogy of building your life house on rock, which is solid and eternal, or on sand, which is temporary and unstable. That's the analogy that Jesus gives. He teaches this. That's what that parable means. And building our framework in our minds and in our hearts, we have to make sure that we're building that framework on godly wisdom, which comes only from God's word. That's how we were made to grow our lives. Amen? Amen? So where does it come from? Today I want to close with this. Where does godly wisdom come from? Where does it begin? In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, Solomon writes this. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Wisdom, gem youth, comes from reverence. Uh, we learn how to live and how to make our decisions from the people that we respect the most. That's how you learn how to think. You learn how to live life from the people that you respect the most. And some of you guys, it could be your friends. Some of you, it's your parents. Some of you, it might be celebrities or people that you love. Like if you, gosh, I hope you don't, but if you love Kanye and, or, or Ye, whatever his name is, uh, like if, if you love him and, and his music and you know, his way of understanding life and living life, if you're absorbing that, I feel really bad for you because that is really far from the presence of God. That is really far from godly wisdom. But some of you guys love certain celebrities um, and you learn from them. Uh, who you respect will probably influence the most how you take action and how you make your decisions in your life. That, it, that that's just how it goes. But again, if, we, if the wisdom that we're gaining, if it's not from God's word, then gem youth, it's not godly wisdom, no matter how good it sounds. It's not godly wisdom. Um, and if it's not godly wisdom, then it's going to shape us to live in an ungodly way and to have an ungodly attitude and so forth. And that's just how it goes. And your trajectory, rather than being going and being with God, the trajectory of your life over the years that you get to live will actually lead you apart from God. God didn't create hell for bad people. Hell exists because we as people who are broken by sin choose to live a life apart from God. We choose to live without godly wisdom because God is open enough to share it with us. He's open enough to give us his word so that we can learn how to live well, to make the best decisions in life. People choose not to. That's why hell exists. It's because people do not want to live with God. And Solomon says that they are fools, fools who despise wisdom and discipline from God. And so I want to close with this. My one takeaway today is this. Wisdom, gem youth, wisdom comes only when we give God our deepest respect. Like only when God has our greatest respect. That's when you will actually gain godly wisdom. And there are moments of this. There, there, there are times when you will, God will be the one that you respect the most, and during that season of your life, you will grow with godly wisdom. And then there might be other seasons in your life when you finally find a yaja chingu or a namja chingu, and you're like, oh, I respect this girl or I respect this boy the most, and then they're going to shape your wisdom, and then they're going to make you grow in a very ungodly way because um, your, your greatest respect is no longer God, but your greatest respect is now a human being. It's a person. My dad always taught me, Hyunjina, never allow me as your dad to be your role model. You do not give me your number one respect. That goes to Jesus because he is God. 
and he is perfect. He is our Savior. No human being should take that place, not even your parents. If you learn to respect God, you will honor your father and your mother. It will happen automatically. One word to clarify, if we can go back to verse 7. Fear of the Lord. This word fear in verse 7 is not the kind of fear that paralyzes someone, making them incapable of doing anything. The kind of fear that Solomon is talking about, the fear of, of the Lord, is the kind of fear that motivates us to change what is not good in me, what is ungodly in me, so that God can make it godly through him, through Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of fear that Solomon is talking about here in verse 7. It is not the kind of fear that paralyzes us. The kind of fear that Solomon is talking about is the kind that motivates us to change because of our reverential fear, our fear of respect for God. Which is why the title of today's sermon is Reverence Begets Wisdom. Wisdom will only come to you, godly wisdom will only come to you if you are giving God the utmost respect more than anyone or anything else. Um, Eugene Peterson, uh, he writes this about biblical wisdom. Wisdom is the biblical term for this on earth as it is in heaven everyday living. The way we think of and respond to God is the most practical thing we do. In matters of everyday practicality, nothing, absolutely nothing, takes precedence over God. Utmost, which is why I love Oswald Chambers' devotional. If you guys don't read it or you haven't read it, I would highly encourage you to read it. My utmost for his highest. God is, again, everything. He has to be that. He must take precedence over everything else in your life. He must be first. So the question that I have for you today is this, Jem Yud. Who do you respect the most in your life? And be honest. Is it you? Like, I respect myself the most. Then you live with that modern day proverbial, you do you. But again, Bible teaches us, uh, no, because when you die, you're not going to go to you. When you die, you either go to God or you go apart from God. That's it. Who do you respect the most? Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's a best friend or a group of friends. In order to earn respect, you have to give respect. Now, even that, as good as it sounds, it's, it's very worldly because even if you, that res or if you don't give that respect or if you receive that respect, you should just still respond with God's grace, but Lord knows we all struggle with that, okay? Who do you respect the most? 